<coughs> Alrighty. The title of this sermon is Those Things Which Are Not Proper, and it is on Romans 1, tw verse 28b. The second part of verse 28 there. <coughs> Greetings, friends. My name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church. And friends, I come down here and my sister Mary May comes down here to preach the gospel of grace to you, to bring to you the, the good news of the Savior Jesus Christ, but also to call out sin. Friends, we're here to call out the sin of abortion. To plead with you not to, not to take the life of your child, not to slaughter the innocent. Friends, this is, this is a very weighty matter, which is, it must be dealt with properly. This is an important issue. The life of your baby, the life of that child in the womb. Friends, I want to say at the beginning, at the outset of this, that I commit myself and my church to help and to aid you in whatever way that we can, if you choose life for your child. I commit myself to walk through the entire process with you and to help you in whatever way that I possibly can to, to perhaps aid you in finding a family to adopt that child or, or in aiding you in, in taking care of that child yourself. Friends, we care for you. We care for your life and the life of your child. And we plead with you Choose life. Do not take the life of the innocent. God has made that child. He, he has put that child, He has woven that child together in your womb as a gift of grace. He has woven that child together in your womb out of His mercy. God has given you a precious gift, dear friends. We just do not desire that you take the life of your child. We desire that you would spare the life of your child for the glory of God, that you would submit yourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and spare your child, spare their life. And we come out here, as I said a moment ago, to preach the Gospel message that Jesus Christ died and rose again to tell you the bad news that you've sinned against God and you deserve His punishment for sin. You deserve hell. But God in His mercy and in His love towards sinners, has, has extended His arm and put forth His Son as the sacrifice for sin. And He has raised Him up from the grave on the third day. Jesus is Lord, my friends. He is Lord and He is worthy of your, of your following after Him, of your ex exalting Him and your praising Him. He is worthy. He is worthy. And so friends, the text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this morning is out of Romans, in Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And it simply reads, it says, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. And that last phrase is, the, is really what I want to highlight before you this morning that those things which are not proper, those things which are not right and which are not pure, are things which ungodly people distract themselves with in this life. They concern themselves with those things. And one such thing, one such sin that would fit into that category would be the sin of abortion, which is specifically what I, I want to address this morning. When it says in this passage that God gave them over to a depraved mind, those being who, those who are ungodly, and gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, one of the things that God gives sinners over to is the sin of abortion, the sin of murder. For God Himself said, "You shall not murder; shall not take the life of those who are innocent." And that is one of the things that God gives the sinners up unto when they rebel against His authority when they rebel against the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And truly, it is not proper and it is not prudent. Organizations like Planned Parenthood and other, uh, other pro-abortion 
groups will try and glorify abortion, will try and exalt this practice of wickedness, this evil deed of unrighteousness, and make it seem appealing, make it seem nice, make it seem something that they would like you to do and something it is enjoyable to do, but my friends, it is not proper. It is not prudent, and it is not God-honoring. It is God-dishonoring, and it grieves God. My friends, it is true that God is angry with the wicked every day, that He hates both the sin and the sinner, yet it grieves Him. It grieves Him. Sin grieves God. And it is something which He dislikes to the uttermost. He hates sin, my friends. Don't grieve your Creator. He sustains you, my friends. He sustains you. He gives you every breath that you breathe, every, every step that you take, every heartbeat that you have in this life is a gift from God. And doing things which are not proper grieves Him. It, it genuinely and deeply grieves God. But there is hope for salvation for those who put into practice those things which are not proper. And the hope of salvation, the hope of eternal life for those who are murderous and who desire to kill their children and who do kill their children, the only hope for such wretched sinners is Jesus Christ. And it is He whom I seek to exalt in this sermon. I want to note very quickly and briefly on the context of Romans 1. Paul, in verse 16, establishes his thesis statement for the book. He establishes what he's going to spend the rest of the book preaching on and writing on, and it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. So he says, I want to tell you the good news. I want to tell you the good tidings of what Jesus Christ has done. But before you understand the good news, friends, you must grasp the depth of your sin, the greatness, the horror of the bad news. And that is why he begins in verse 18 with saying these words, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. O oh, sinners, you must come to understand that you are sinners, to understand your sinful state before God. You must. It is an imperative. You cannot understand the gospel message. If you do not grasp the bad news of your sin, and specifically in relation to the sin that you find yourself here this morning desiring to commit, that sin of abortion, that you are here taking part in the murder of your child, and even you doctors and nurses, receptionists in this place, you have a part to play in this drama to play in this story, this story of sin. You have guilt. If you so much as work here, you have guilt. Because you take part in the murder of the innocent. Hey Mary, watch out, okay sister? Oh no, I just want to be sure you, you saw him. Thank you very much. I just want to be sure you saw that car. You want to address them directly? She's going in for the abortion pill. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. God bless. God bless the preaching of the gospel. <clears throat> and so, you must come to understand your bad news. And you two young ladies who just stopped in the driveway. You need to understand the bad news. And I don't want to sugarcoat this. The sin you're about to commit and you're about to take part in committing will earn you hell. It will earn you eternal torment. And it will bring you not only eternal torment, <laughs> praise the Lord, 
Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. Praise God. Oh, man. Oh, wow, that's good. That's good fuel to continue to preach. Praise God. Dear friends, we just had a, a couple of young ladies come up in the driveway. And my dear sister in the Lord pleaded with them concerning this sin. And they turned around. Dear friends, we care for you. Do not do this. Do not lose your soul. Not only is this an eternal issue, but this is even a temporal issue. You're going to have a hard life after today. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get easier. Killing your baby does not make your life easier. It does not alleviate whatever issues you have. It's just going to make it worse. It's going to add another layer of stress, anxiety, and depression. Just go look it up. Go look up the suicide rates of women who've had abortions. It's exponential. Look up the rates of women who are depressed after having an abortion. It's exponential. It's because it's an unnatural thing. It is not proper to slaughter your child. But as I was saying, Paul there in verse 18 explains the bad news. And then he continues on explaining that. And we find ourselves... Just 10 verses later in verse 28, and he is still talking about the bad news. Sinful man outside of the grace of God, outside of salvation in Jesus Christ, is totally depraved. Look at what he says in verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Friends, you cannot, you cannot understand the gospel because your mind is depraved. You're, you're dead in sin. And friends, we come out here hoping that God will, will save you from your sins and raise you to spiritual life and give you eternal life in His Son and regenerate you by His Holy Spirit. For Jesus Himself said that one is born of the Spirit. You cannot be born again by your own will, by your own flesh. It is by the, the will of God, by the power of God, and by the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. God gave them over to a depraved mind. And then we find ourselves here at the end of the verse to do those things which are not proper, which is what I want to focus my attention on. Those things which are not proper. And one of those things that are not proper is certainly the sin of abortion. And I tell you, my friends, I tell you this because I care for you. God made that child. It's God's. It's God's child. It's His ownership. It's not really your child. In one sense it is, but above that, it is God's. It is God's child. God grants life. God is the one who can give and take away. In fact, when you, when you commit the sin of, a, uh, of, of abortion, you're taking in your own hands that which belongs only to God, the sovereignty that God possesses intrinsically, to, uh, able to take life, able to grant life. That's God's ownership. And it greatly dishonors Him to slaughter your child. In fact, God said very simply in Exodus 20, in verse 13, listen to how clear this command is. Listen to how straightforward this is. God doesn't hide it. It's just out there. He says, you shall not commit murder. Four words that address the issue of abortion. God says, you shall not commit murder. You, you cannot. It's forbidden by God. And so when you do that, when you break God's law, you, in, you bring upon yourself God's punishment against sin. When you trample God's law on your foot, He takes notice. He takes, he takes detailed notice. In fact, Jesus said that every idle word that man speaks, it's going to be brought into account. That's right. Not only is your sin of abortion going to be taken into account, 
not only is your sin of murdering your own child going to be taken into account, but other sins which you commit. Your fornication is going to be taken into account. Your adultery is going to be taken into account. Your lying is going to be taken into account. Your thievery is going to be taken into account. Every blasphemous word you speak is going to be taken into account. Every filthy joke you tell is going to be taken into account. And you're going to be punished for your sin. And that is why you need salvation in Jesus Christ. For there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. There is something especially filthy and disgusting about abortion. It is one thing to go and to murder someone out on the streets, another adult, perhaps. But it is something much greater and much more evil to take the life of a child in the safest place on earth, in its own mother's womb, where it finds nourishment, where it finds care, protection from all outside entities to invade that, that, that special place that God has set aside for the child to be kept in as it develops is a great evil a great evil it is one thing to kill a man out in the field as he is working it is a great other thing to kill a man as he is sleeping in his bed at night. See, my friends, you think, oh, all sins are equal. So if I kill my baby and uh, if I tell a lie, they're, they're just basically the same little thing, you know, right? Wrong. God sees sins differently. It is true that all sin ultimately deserves the same punishment, which is hell. But God sees your sin as especially heinous and especially evil. God said in Galatians chapter 6, through the Apostle Paul in Galatians 6 7, he said, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. You're sowing something today, friends, and you're going to reap it, both in this life and the life to come. It is something that is not proper, as the text that we are looking at reads. It is not proper to do what you're doing. It's an improper thing. In our society, and our culture today, we've really lost a sense of that which is proper. Confusion about homosexuality, gender identity and other things. We have really lost a sense of that which is proper. But I want to tell you this, God has not. God knows what is right and what is wrong. He defines it by His own nature. And friends, it is wrong to slaughter your child. It is improper. Why, though? Why is it that God says it's improper? Why is it that it is improper? Why is it that sin is what it is? It is because of the character of God. My friends, I want to explain to you who God is because you really do not know who God is. You're ignorant of who God is. Many people are ignorant of the true God's nature. Of the true God's characteristics. God is a, is a holy God. He's a just judge. He is absolutely perfect. Scripture describes Him time and time and time again as a perfect, just, righteous, holy, and pure judge. He is absolutely perfect. In fact, the Bible says He's good. That's terrifying. That's absolutely terrifying that God is good. God is absolutely good in every way. That's scary. That's very scary. Because man is not good. Man is intrinsically bad. 
God is holy. He's set apart from that which is evil. He's just. That being that He punishes sin. He has a law. He has a standard by which He judges. It is true that God is merciful and gracious. I mean, feel this. If, you're, if you just step outside, you feel this beautiful breeze upon your face. It's, it speaks to the mercy and grace of God. In fact, right now, the fact that you're not in hell and I'm not in hell, burning, deserving, what, uh, getting what we deserve is, a, is, a, is, a, is an absolute manifestation of God's mercy. Because God's holding back from us what we deserve. God is love, absolutely. God is the definition of love. He is what defines love. But my friends, that never takes away and it never negates His holiness. It doesn't cancel out. It's not like God's attributes cancel one another out. They beautifully mix together. They beautifully define one another. And they stand even on their own, each of them. But never in contradiction to the others. And so God, being perfect, being holy, has given His law. He has put forth His commands. Just as a judge here in Greenville has a set code of morality by which He judges those who break the law, so too does God have a, a code of morality. God gives commands. God gives imperatives about how people are to live. God is not distant. God has not left Himself to be hidden. He has revealed Himself. He has revealed Himself in His law, in His commands. As I, I just read out of Exodus 20 where we find the Ten Commandments. Listen to some of the commands God gives. God says in Exodus 20, verse 12, Honor your father and mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Verse 13, you shall not murder. Verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. God has given certain laws for us to obey. And these laws define to us, and they spell out, quite literally, God's character. Who God is. Who is God? Well, we know from these commands that He is not a murderer. That He's not unfaithful. That He's not a thief. That He's not a liar. Do you see? For God Himself said, you shall not murder. It's because He's not a murderous God. God says you shall not commit adultery because He's a faithful, covenant-keeping God. God says you, you shall not steal. And the book of Hebrews tells us it is impossible. All right, excuse me. I'm sorry. God says you shall not steal. It's because God's not a thief. And then it says you shall not bear false witness. In other words, you shall not lie. And the book of Hebrews tells us that God, it is impossible for him to lie. It is repulsive to his character to bear false witness. God is not also covetous. Perfect in all his ways. The psalmist said in Psalm 106 verse 1, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. For he is good. He is good. Both in His dealings and in His character. Good. And His goodness is shown in His law. And then we see something else in the law as we look at it. Well, it's not necessarily in the law, but in us. Revealed by the law. Our hearts are darkened closets and the, the law of God is like a flashlight that shines in the darkness and we see what is in there. And what is contained in us is evil and filth, sewage and iniquity. For God, as He said, you shall not steal, we've stolen. 
God says you shall not covet. That is, you should not look upon something that someone else has in a sinful, selfish way. It's really, an, it's really a form of idolatry when you're idolizing something someone else has. You're a materialistic person. And oh, how our society is built around materialism and covetousness. God hates that. And oh, how we do that all the time. God says you shall not lie. How many of you have lied in your life? Or here is something that touches to the issue which I have spoken on already this morning, that being the issue of abortion. God says, you shall not murder. You shall not kill someone unjustifiably. You shall not take the life of those who did nothing to deserve their life being taken from them. And you have done that this day, or are planning to do that this day. Moreover, Jesus Himself said in Matthew 5 that if you're angry with your brother, if you're angry with someone else in a sinful fashion, then you've actually already committed murder. You've already broken the law in your heart. Jesus also said in that same chapter, if you look with lust, if you look at someone in a sexual way, and it's with sexual desire, who is not your spouse. You've committed adultery in the heart. God sees the mind, friends. God sees the heart. God sees the inward intentions even. He sees all the way down to your core of your being. He knows you better than you know yourself. And you know what He sees? Is it good? Is it good intentions? Does He look down and say, well, you know what? They're trying their best, and so I'm going to be propitious toward them. Well, Genesis 6, 5 answers the question. It says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And listen to what it says in verse 6. The Lord was sorry that He had made man on the earth, and He was grieved in His heart. God is grieved by your sin. He is grieved by even the evil intents of your heart to do sin. Don't say you have a good heart and don't say you have good intentions. You don't. You hate God. You hate God. How do I know that? Romans 1. Listen to verse 30. It says they are slanderers, haters of God. You hate God. It's not that you're just this indifferent position or you're just neutral ground. You hate the God who loved you so much to create you and to give you everything you have and to sustain you. Think about this. God is sustaining you even as you sin against Him. He is enabling you to breathe as you sin against Him. He's giving you the breath that you have and you use that breath to blaspheme Him. Think about how great your dishonoring of God is, friends. It is evil. Evil, evil, evil. And God will not simply look over it. He cannot. Just as a judge here in Greenville cannot let a, a murderer walk away without being punished, so too does God have such a zeal for His own holiness that He cannot, He cannot sweep sin under the rug. Listen to Proverbs 6, verse 16. It says, There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to Him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. You doctors in here, your hands shed innocent blood day in and day out, and you're paid for it. God hates it. Hates it. And hates you for your sin against Him. I love when they do that. And so sinful man, and I'm not, I'm not saying this from a position of haughtiness. I'm not saying, oh, you're sinners and I'm better than you. No, I know that I'm worse than you. I'm more vile than you. My heart is more sinful than yours. I know it. I'm a wretch. I say with the words of the Apostle Paul that I am the chief among sinners. I know it. 
The only difference between me and you is the Savior has saved me. The chief among sinners. So friends, because of our sin before God, outside of Christ, outside of God's saving grace, our state is, 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 is very, very hopeless. There's no hope. We are condemned, we are guilty, and we're depraved, and we deserve hell. We deserve God's punishment for sin, which is eternal hellfire. God's punishment for adultery. God's punishment for fornication. God's punishment for pornography. God's punishment for murder. God's punishment for lying, and thievery, and blasphemy, and covetousness. Is hell. That place of torment. Hell is a real place, friends. Jesus spoke about it more than any other person in all of Scripture. He even spoke about it more than He did about heaven. To warn sinners of its terror and its horror. Listen to the way Jesus described hell in Mark 9, verse 47. He says, If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out, for it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. There is no horror or torture of heaven, of, of earth, that can possibly compare to the horror of hell. Jesus says it's so bad, you'd rather mutilate parts of your body and go to heaven at being mutilated than go to hell with all your body and not be mutilated. That's how bad hell is. He says it's a place that is a fire that's never quenched. It never goes away. It's constantly burning. One of the words that Jesus uses in the New Testament for hell is Gienna. And it's derived from two Hebrew words, Gay and Hinnom, which was the place, Gay Hinnom, which was a, was a place outside of Jerusalem in Jesus' day in, in ancient Israel, where they would, they would, it was a little valley, a little ravine, and they would throw all their trash, they would even throw dead bodies there. And they would have continually burning fires to burn up all the trash and the dead bodies as they threw them in there day in and day out, week in and week out, year in and year out. It was a place that was considered cursed in ancient times before Jesus came along. And Jesus uses that term to describe how it's a constantly churning, burning, and unquenchable flame. And it never goes away. In fact, the book of Revelation tells us that the smoke of the torment of those who are in hell goes up forever. It even describes hell as a bottomless pit. Jesus described it as a place of outer darkness, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is not somewhere you want to go. Flee the wrath of God. That's what hell is. It's the unleashing of God's wrath. It's not this place. Praise God. It's not some place that Satan or the devil's poking people with a, fitch, uh, with a pitchfork in the back. It is a place of torment where God is doing the punishing. And God is unleashing His wrath. And God is unleashing His fury. And you can do nothing to get out of this situation you're in. You can do nothing to save yourselves from this impending wrath. You're lost. Eternally. Hopeless. No good deeds can make you amended to God. No righteousness is sufficient of your own.
You were totally without hope. No pastor, no priest, no prayers, no Bible reading. Nothing can help you. Nothing can save you. You're lost eternally. Listen to what Romans 3.20 says. By the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. You cannot make yourself right with God by your own works. That was never the intent of God's law. So we are truly without any hope. And if Jesus Christ was not Lord, and Jesus Christ had not come, and had not died upon that cross, and not had, had not been raised from the grave, then I, at this point, would step down and have nothing else to say. Because there would be no salvation. Because there would be no Savior. Because there would be no hope. But my friends, I have great joy in my heart exceeding joy to tell you this my friends God has sent forth his son God has so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life the father loves the son the father loves his son so much Yet, He let Him go into this world. The second person of the Trinity, eternal God, the eternal Word, came and became flesh and dwelt among men. All of the religions in the world, you've got to work your way up to God. You've got to pull yourself up. You've got to amend yourself with your Creator. But biblical Christianity, God works Himself down. God condescends. God comes and dwells among men. That is precisely what the gospel is. God with us. Jesus, as we know through the prophet Isaiah, would be known as Emmanuel. God with us. He came and fulfilled the law that we broke. Do you remember those commands which we considered at the beginning? Those commands that God gave, Jesus fulfilled them. Listen to what He said in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He came to fulfill those laws, and then He went to that cross. He did something glorious at that cross. He was Before He even was nailed to that cross, He was beaten, He was whipped. He was spat upon, given a, a, a crown of thorns. He was hated. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. Yes, He was despised and we did not esteem Him. He went to that cross and was nailed there and hung there as the Lamb of God. On that cross for those hours between two thieves. His grave was assigned with wicked men. And on that cross in those few hours, something happened which the physical eye cannot see. Something which even His disciples standing there could not see. Something which even those thieves as they were beside Him on that cross could not see. And it was this. The eternal weight of God's wrath is put on His Son. The eternal wrath of Almighty God is unleashed upon His Son, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior. Christ bore God's wrath. The Father, instead of sending sinners to hell, instead of sending His people to eternal torment and punishing them, in the sea of His wrath, He takes His Son and drowns Him in His wrath. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin 
for us. There is such glory to that. There is such beauty to that. That Christ, instead of, instead of staying in heaven where He had the right to be, He laid aside His privileges. He laid aside the worship of angels and the exaltation of the heavenly hosts. And He steps down and He condescends and He lives this life of perfect obedience and perfect law keeping. He keeps that law that we broke, we trampled underfoot, and He stretched upon that cross and He satisfies God's wrath against sin. And the Father whom He loved was pleased to crush Him whom He loved. He was pleased to crush His Son. Listen to Isaiah 53 verse 10. It says, But Yahweh was pleased to crush Him, putting Him to grief. Oh my friends, He cried out on that cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken of God and crushed. He was crushed. The hell that I deserve and that all of God's people deserve was put on Christ. Every ounce of wrath was put on Him. And that is why the text in Isaiah 53 could say this in verse 5. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him and by His scourging. We are healed. Friends, this is the glory of the Gospel that Jesus Christ is Lord and the Lord of glory. The One who gave you life and sustains all of the heavenly bodies, all the celestial creation, all of the heavens above, the earth beneath, the water under the earth, everything sustained by the Word of His power. The eternal God condescends and dies for His creation. Creator dying for creation. That's the beauty of the Gospel. God looked upon His Son on that cross as if He was a liar, as if He was a thief, though in fact He was not. As though He was a, a murderer, though He was not. And Jesus, in that moment of death, cried out one word, And the word is to telestai. The word that Jesus cried out in that hour of death was to telestai, which means it is finished. It's done. The payment is made. God's wrath is satisfied. And three days later, after He was laid in that tomb for three days, God the Father rose His Son up from the grave. He's alive today, friends. He is alive and He will never die again. He is high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He was raised, my friends. He appeared bodily to His disciples on that Lord's Day morning, on that Sunday morning, those many, many years ago. And then He continued to minister for 40 more days. And then after 40 days, He took His disciples up to the Mount of Olives, which was a mountain. It was more like a ravine. It was a very small mountain. He goes up and he's, he's talking to disciples and the Scripture says He was taken up before their eyes. He was received into glory and Scripture says He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God on high. He sat down and the work of salvation, the work of redemption is complete. It's gone. It's, it's finished. Christ has put away God's wrath. It is done. The law has been fulfilled. It is done. Christ has been raised from the dead. It is done. And He reigns as King to this day. He reigns as King. The King of glory. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Mighty in battle. 
That's what the psalm says in Psalm 24. It says these words. Lift up, this is verse 7. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And this King... This Lord, Jesus Christ, the merciful, kind, and compassionate Savior, the God of glory, commands you this day to bow the knee in submission to Him, to repent and believe the gospel of grace. Jesus said in Mark 1.15, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Turn from your sin. Flee your sins. Turn away from your abortion. Turn away from your murderous hearts. Turn away from your fornication. Turn away from your adultery. Turn away from your selfishness. Turn away from your pride. Turn away from your covetousness. Turn away from all of it. Be sick of yourself. Be sick of your sin. Flee. And flee to the Savior. That's the second thing. Believe. Two things, repent and believe. Believe. Just take God at His Word. The great reformer Martin Luther said, we are saved by believing simply the promises of God. And that is so true. That is the only way of salvation. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. You want to know how to be saved? Have faith in God's promises that are revealed in Jesus Christ. It is a promise that God has given. Romans 3.28 For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Romans chapter 4 verse 3 For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Verse 4 Now to the one who does not work but believes in him who, Excuse me, verse 5 But to the one who does not work but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is credited as righteousness. Romans 5.1 Therefore, having been justified by faith, grab hold of God's promises in Jesus Christ and you'll be saved from your sins. You'll be forgiven of your sins and given a place in heaven, given a place in glory. You'll be given a new nature, a new heart. You'll be regenerated. You'll be born from above. Your life will be changed. You'll be forgiven of all your sins. Every sin that you have ever committed, ever will commit, will be forgiven. On that moment, you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will credit you with having lived Jesus' life. He will wrap you in the righteousness of Christ. You'll be justified on the merits of Christ. It's righteousness, friends. Do you have perfect righteousness? No, you don't. No, I don't. No, no man has perfect righteousness but Jesus Christ. He is our righteousness. Jeremiah prophesied in Jeremiah 23 verse 6 that Christ is, Yah is going to be Yahweh to sit canoe. That is the Lord, our righteousness. He is the righteousness which you need. And if you believe on Him, you'll have His righteousness. God will look upon you as if you lived Jesus' life because He looked upon Christ as if He lived your life. That's the exchange of the Gospel. That's the greatest exchange, the greatest deal, the greatest bargain that ever has been created, ever been thought of. That God takes my sin away and I get His very righteousness. Believe this. And if you believe this today, you will be changed. You will be changed forevermore. Your life will take radical change. You will not continue on in your sin. You can't. If you do, whatever you supposedly had is false. If you are a true follower of Christ, if you become a true follower of Christ today, your life will radically change. In fact, if, you, if you're saved, you'll come out of those doors. And you'll renounce this evil. 
God does not save people and leave them in their sin, but He gives them a new heart and a new nature and new desires. God changes people's lives. And if you say you're a Christian here today and you are living in sin and right now here today you're committing another sin to heap upon the rest of the sins you're living in, it's because you're a hypocrite, you're outside of Christ, you're dead in sin and you're lost. You're not saved. If you say you're a Christian and you're here today to slaughter your child, then I want to tell you something. Stop calling yourself a Christian. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop trampling Jesus' name under foot. Stop blaspheming Jesus. And stop making it so difficult for me and other true Christians to share the gospel with the lost. If you say you're a Christian, I want you to go home and renounce it and tell everyone that you're no longer a Christian. Because you're not. And I want to encourage you to turn from your hypocrisy and be genuinely saved. And then go around telling everyone that you are a false convert, you are a liar, and you've been saved by the grace of God truly, and be a testimony to the saving power of God. Are you living in habitual, continual, blatant sin? If so, you're lost. You're lost, you're lost, you're lost. I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about where is the direction of your life moving? Are you moving toward more sin, more iniquity, and more evil? Are you moving toward more righteousness, more holiness, and more purity? Disregard what you say. What is your life pointing to? Is it pointing toward more sin or more righteousness? More holy, God-exalting living. That's how you know you're a true Christian. Jesus Himself said in Matthew 7, in verse 16, You will know them by your fruits. Four verses down, or excuse me, five verses down in verse 20. So then you will know them by their fruits. Do you want to know whether you're a true Christian or not? Examine your life. So whether you're a pagan, Repent and believe. If you're a false convert, repent and believe. Repent and believe the gospel of grace. Please, examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith, lest Christ not be in you. Turn to Christ and live, friends. Look to Him and live. Turn or burn eternally. Be saved from your sins by the grace of God. So we have seen here in closing, in Romans 1 verse 28, those things which are not proper. And one of those being the sin of abortion. And I want to again lay before you the wager that I gave at the beginning. If you choose life, I commit myself and my church to take care of you and your child, to help you in any way we can. We're not a large church. We don't have much, but what we do have, we will help you with there's a place just up the road they'll they will help you adopt your uh, give up your child for adoption help you find work help you in every any way you can they're wonderful folks fantastic folks just up the road a few minutes my sister mary i'm sure would have no problem taking you there right now or i myself even Please, choose life. Don't slaughter your child. And believe the gospel of grace. God is gracious. I've spoken much on His holiness, much on His wrath, and even much on His grace, but I want to leave off with a note of God's grace. Please do not reject His saving grace in Christ. Instead, give Him the glory. This is all done to the glory of God. 
all to the glory of God. So to God be glory. To God be the honor. To God be the praise. It's all for Him. It's all for God and all for His glory. Listen to what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 115 verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to Your name give glory because of Your loving kindness and because of Your truth. Indeed, to God be the glory forever and ever because of the gospel of Jesus Christ.